Welcome to another special episode of The Dark Parade. My name is Bo, and I'm a found footage fool. Tell me the camera thing isn't annoying. Yeah, it's annoying. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of The the Dark Parade. At this time, another uh, edition of The Found Footage Fool. Uh, my name is Bo. And let me begin by uh, apologizing for the, um, the, the, the bad sound in the last episode. And I don't know that the sound is particularly better here. I think it's better. But the problem was, I'm, like, I'm in the process of uh, moving around a little bit. Uh, my girlfriend and I are moving in together, which, you know, probably a mistake. It's probably a terrible idea. Um, <laughs> we'll see how this all works out. Uh, at any rate... Um, I just got everything set up to record. Uh, the room has not been properly baffled and there was a bit of an echo. Uh, so, you know, some I'll work on, uh, and, and hopefully this sound won't be too bad, but let us turn now to our filthy business. Um, I am on the back end of, uh, the school stuff, which is great. I believe that I've now officially graduated I'm waiting for the official word, but then, you know, a bunch of stuff happens after that where I'm learning uh, where I'm going to be able to teach and all that fun stuff. So, um, but man, that was exhausting. I feel quite tired, but it is now done. And there is something to be said for setting a, a goal to finish a thing and then finishing that thing. But that has nothing to do with our dark business and that is to continue our look at the paranormal activity movies and in looking at the paranormal activity movies i've come up with a bit of a theory and that theory is this that it is the reverse star trek phenomenon in which every odd numbered paranormal activity movie is good or at least tolerable Uh, and that is going to begin with Paranormal Activity 3. So we'll do 3 and 4 today, and then 5 and 6, and then, um, you know, we've already done, what was the last of Ken? Next of Ken? Some, one of those? What, what was the one with uh, Patrick Swayze? What Paranormal Activity was he in? Next of Ken? Um, <laughs> so it, it's one of them. But uh, this one is directed by Henry Joost and Ariel Schulman who um, were coming off of Catfish. And uh, they, they ended up doing the next couple of these. And Christopher Landon, again, uh, is in on the writing of these along with... Um, I think he's... No, he's solely credited on Paranormal Activity 3 at any rate. So Paranormal Activity 3... Um, whereas the second one ends with Katie showing up at her sister's place and stealing the kid Hunter paranormal, paranormal activity three goes back to sort of do the origin story of, you know, Katie and, um, her sister, uh, Christy, who I think I, I said that Christy was the daughter in paranormal activity too. So, you know, what are you going to do? Sue me. And so what uh, what ends up happening in Paranormal Act- Activity 3 is that we get a little bit of um, a look at the sisters, like, around moving day or whatever, pre the events of Paranormal Activity 1 and 2. And they're putting a bunch of videotapes in storage at Christie's house. And we learn that these videotapes were shot by their parents. And so the, the movie is really those videotapes, which is kind of a thin premise because you feel like this stuff would have come up before. And I think that's kind of one of the biggest problems of the movie, which we'll get into when we're talking about the, the tropes. Um, but it, it, it like it feels like enough happened when they were kids that somebody should have talked about this, at least to some extent. Um, at any rate, such as, uh, such as life, as it were. And, uh, well, let's get into the troops. 
Speaking of, you know, that's that's the premise. Weird stuff happens in the lore of the Paranormal Activity movies. The thing that I, I think is kind of interesting about it is that it um, it sort of explains to some degree this, you know, coven of witches that seem to be part of the family or whatever that made this deal that is mentioned in the second movie. From Humble Origins begins a convoluted story. Not quite as convoluted as, say, the Saw movies, but still pretty convoluted. So let's uh, let's get to the keeping the camera on for Paranormal Activity 3. And I think, for the most part, I think this works. Um, you know, the, the Katie and Christie's father is... Uh, like a wedding videographer in the eighties and has some, you know, pretty decent camera equipment for the time. And, um, and because there is weird stuff happening, you know, much like the first movie, it, it really is about him, um, trying to capture this, which I also like more than what happens in paranormal activity Two, where it's just a lot of, kind of random observation, you know, like security cameras and stuff like that. And then occasionally something will happen. Um, This is much more directed, uh, you know, that we are intentionally trying to find out what's going on in the house and, and with the kids in particular. And one of my favorite things from this entire series is actually in this movie in which there is a camera mounted on an oscillating fan which allows the camera to kind of go back and forth uh, across the room and which leads to some pretty good gags and including one that involves a um uh like a ghost like a charlie brown <laughs> great pumpkin ghost that you see creeping up behind a uh a babysitter and then it just, you know, collapses. Um, shout out also to the, the buddy in the movie, um, which I think is, is Randy, I think is his name. And like some of the best stuff happens with him. There's a really good sequence where he's kind of babysitting. Um, one of the kids, I think it's Katie while Christy goes to the hospital Eh, as something, and um, he ends up kind of capturing when things really start to pop off. And it's like they're doing a Bloody Mary thing. It's, it's good. It's like a good creepy moment in the movie. Um, but, but in terms of keeping the camera on, like it all makes sense why the camera is turned on. Until you get to the end... And that, you know, falls into the category of, like, with everything going on, the camera is, like, the least of your problems. You need to put that down and just take care of business, (laughs) you know, uh, rather than uh, try to capture this on film because, like, your children are in mortal danger. Um, So, mm, maybe that, not so much, but, but for the most part, up until the conclusion then you get to the characters and I actually think, you know, unlike the second movie where I could not give a shit about any of those characters. Um, I think that, you know, um, Rand, not Randy, but, uh, uh, Dennis and Julie are the parents and they're, they're fun and they're, they're, uh, like interesting people. And I like their relationship that they have with one another. And Randy is the friend is good. Kenny and Christy as the kids, I mean, they're fine. Um, but the the adults are kind of what makes it all work. And I was genuinely impressed. I thought it was all really good. Uh, as, as far as just like being compelling characters that you want to follow. Um, so characters, thumbs up. Uh, unlike the second movie. Um, authenticity, I mean... Yeah, because you're doing a period piece, like I think the cameras are a little too good or the the quality of film is a little too good for the for the time, even though they try to explain that away with like, hey, you know, this guy bought expensive cameras um, because of his job. I still think it's a little too good. But other than that, like if, as as time pieces go, as period pieces go, it's it's not the worst. Um 
I, you know, but, but authenticity, as we've talked about on the show before, isn't just, you know, is it period, uh, as a period piece, does it work? But also is this, you know, like, does it feel authentic within the world of, of the, the movie? And that's something I kind of alluded to earlier. I, I have trouble with that, man. It, uh, you know, there, there's a real, um, disconnect for me that if all of this had happened when they were kids, why on earth would they not talk about this as adults? Like, why would they not have ended up on a talk show talking about the crazy cult they were in when they were children? <laughs> Cause that's what it comes down to, right? Is they were, you know, by the end of this movie, they're, you know, being led away by, uh, their grandmother with, you know, mom and dad dead. And especially the father, man, he goes so bad. It, it's one of my favorite deaths in, in the series as well. Um, cause he just gets, you know, his back cracked from behind. It, it's pretty gnarly. Um, all right. So then we get to watchability and I do think this is one of in the grand scheme of the paranormal activity series, it's one of the more watchable of the, of the sequels. Uh, you know, we'll get into four in a minute, but you know, I think one and three so far in, in these rewatches that I've been doing are the, are the ones that are compelling and, and I've really enjoyed my time with them, even if, you know, they're imperfect, especially the third one. Like it's not perfect by any stretch, but it is a more entertaining edition of the series than some of the others. Uh, so watchability I, I put up there and, and that brings us to our fifth criteria, which is scares. And I think that it's pretty creepy. The third one, uh, paranormal activity, pretty creepy. Like I said, the, the ghost thing with the oscillating camera is really well done. Um, there, that whole bloody Mary sequence is really, really good. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it also introduces the idea that this is a thing that is called Toby by the kids, which again, feels like something that would have come up in the previous movies, but whatever. Um, yeah, I think, I think it all like, this is a good creepy entry into the franchise. Is it as good as the first one? Of course not. Um, is it better than two for sure? Uh, so, you know, we'll, we'll kind of leave it there. Paranormal activity three, completely watchable, has some good scares in it. It's a good late night, you know, curl up under the blanket kind of, and especially if you're into this franchise, um, as I am, it, it is one of the better entries, but that brings us to paranormal activity four and paranormal activity four is not good. Um, paranormal activity four does bring us back to the present, which is, I suppose, a good thing. Um, it, it, so in this one, it's a family that is living in um, a, kind of a suburban neighborhood. And somebody they end up taking in this kid, um, Robbie. And Robbie is the daughter of... Um, a woman that they don't really know very well, but she had to go to the hospital. So they were just like, here, take this kid for a couple of days. And I know, I mean, it just makes no sense. And so there's the, the father, mother, the, the brother, the younger boy in the family, Wyatt. And then, um, Alex, who is kind of, you know, young teen girl, um, and is, uh, played by Catherine Newton. And I mean, we'll, we'll get into this as, as we're talking about the characters, I suppose, but I don't like the way that this movie presents her and, and maybe it's just cause I'm, you know, old and crotchety, but I have my problems with that. 
Um, but so the premise is they, you know, they're, they take in this kid for a few days. He's a creepy kid. He's like, uh, that kid from Jerry Maguire only, you know, like all, all the weird knowledge, but none of the, <laughs> like maybe this kid's okay. Uh, and charming. He's just a, a creepy little kid. And he and Wyatt become close and they start to share secrets and, you know, then the mother comes back and we realize, oh, oh my goodness, the mother is actually Katie from, uh, you know, the previous films uh, who is possessed. And you're like, oh, is this kid that is Stan, is that Hunter, you know, the one, the kid that she stole? And what you learn through the series, which is head scratching, is that no, 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 she had this other kid and Wyatt is actually Hunter. But you're like, well, then how on earth did you like, why did you let Hunter go in the first place? How did he end up being adopted? None of this makes any sense. So anyway, that is your story. And then, of course, one thing leads to another and a coven shows up and Hunter gets swiped by the family again. And, you know, to be continued in paranormal activity five. Right. Um, so let's get to keeping the camera on. Is this, uh, th- does the movie make a good case for keeping the camera on? And yeah, yeah, it does. Um, you know, but it's mostly security footage and laptop stuff. So it's a lot of the girl kind of walking around with her laptop or with her phone or, you know, or with like a handheld camera. And, you know, again, by the end of the movie, you kind of run into that same problem that you do with uh, part two or not part two, but part three, rather, where the main character is carrying a camera around while there, where there is mortal terror happening. And it's like, eh, you need to put the camera down and just focus on the job at hand. But, uh, you know, for the most part, it's all like security camera footage and laptop footage and stuff like that. So it's, it's fine. And I do like the fact that it's kind of a mix of all that stuff. So you get to kind of follow Alex around and there are some nice moments where like you can see some stuff behind her that she doesn't see. And so that's pretty good. Um, Then you get to the characters. um, And there's some business about like the mother and father uh, having some relationship problems. There's there's kind of a, a, you know, shitty boyfriend that uh, that Alex is dealing with. Who's not? I mean, he, he seems okay, but it's not a terribly interesting character. Um, I, I, my big regret is that they don't do more with those parents because the idea of having an adopted child in a home and having him go creepy on you is something that I think would actually be compelling. Um, and, and it just doesn't ever get into any of that. Um, it, it's content with just being another paranormal activity movie in, instead of really capturing what made the first paranormal paranormal activity movie so good, which is the characters, right? So it's kind of a bummer that it doesn't know enough. It, it, it doesn't have enough like confidence as a movie to think like, oh, if we make these parents like kind of struggling with this child that it could be a more interesting route and it, it just never bothers to do any of that stuff. Um, the other problem I have is the presentation of Catherine, which again, I, you know, maybe I'm just reading it wrong, but it really does seem like they are sexualizing this character of this, you know, preteen to early teen girl in a way. Um, up to and including like her boyfriend talking about like, oh, they're, they talk about letting the blood of a virgin um, to complete this ritual that will make Hunter, you know, a vessel for a demon or something. And um, he's like, well, you know, we can just go upstairs and take care of this virgin problem. And which is, you know, oh, kind of funny, I guess, but also like, I don't know, man. 
like this girl is really underage and the fact that we're talking about sex with her at all is is slightly uncomfortable and just the fact that we're always in her bedroom i don't know man it just feels creepy maybe it's just because i'm you know a middle-aged man i'm like i don't know that i should be watching this um and also being around a you know 11 year old girl um at home and just being like i wouldn't want you know uh, like a girl a couple of years older even to be seen this way um you know like even the the like the poster is her with you know like short shorts on uh, as she's sleeping and you know being threatened and i don't you know again maybe i'm just getting old but i find that to be a little off-putting um Okay, so then let's talk about authenticity, uh, which, again, is within the world of the movie, does this all feel like something that could actually happen? And uh, on that regard, yes, I mean, we're, we're kind of expanding the lore of the Paranormal Activity series. I just think the whole idea of, like, why have this kid you know, Robbie try to seduce Hunter, uh, who we learn is Hunter, um, into accepting the demonology stuff. Like it feels like you're putting a hat on a hat. Like you don't need two kids when one kid will suffice. Uh, like having Katie be the creepy neighbor who has a weird interest in this kid is kind of enough. Um, but again, it's been so long since I've seen five. Like, I don't remember if Robbie, is a thing anymore um so i don't know i don't know it's very interesting to me that like the the series took this turn um but it also like because uh, you are watching this as mostly security footage and conversations over zoom or whatever well, not zoom but the you know webcam chat equivalent of that in 2012 um because we are doing that, it doesn't feel as if this is really film footage. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, the one thing I do like about it is, uh, and this goes back to the, the camera stuff, but they introduce the idea of the, the connect, throwing the dots across the room so you can see like ghosts and stuff moving around. I think that works pretty well. Um yeah, I just don't find it. Like, let's get to the watchability because that's really where all of this is headed, which is, is this movie watchable? And that's the problem you run into is that this movie's just kind of boring. Like for all of the lore that they're throwing at you for a, a big stretch of the movie, it's just these t- two kids kind of bouncing around and being creepy. And I just, it's not compelling enough to make you care about any of this. Um, it, it, it really is a disappointing entry, um, which again leads to my theory that like, Hey, for every one in three, you get a two in four. Um, and I, I think this might be slightly better than two for me, even with all my reservations about how it treats its characters and so forth. I think it's at least slightly more interesting than, than two, but both of them are totally disposable. Um, and you know, the fact that you kind of end up in the same place that you do at three, which is you have the main character kind of running around and then, you know, running into a coven and then jump scare at the end and you're kind of done. Um, yeah, you know, this is definitely one of those that feels like, it, it, it is close to being an entertaining and compelling movie. It just never gets there. And so I've got too much of this movie I spent just kind of checking my watch and wanting to be done with this. Um, and then, and you know, let's talk about scares uh, since that is the scientific criteria that we are using. Um, is this scary? No, not even a little bit. There, There is nothing frightening in the movie. It all feels like stuff that you've seen before in the series up to and including the end of the movie, which is usually where you get, 
um, a little bit of creativity, you know, like in the last movie, you got this incredible death where this guy just gets bent in half backwards and you're like, Oh shit, that, <laughs> that looks painful. All of that stuff, uh, is missing from part four. It, it's a bad entry into this series. It's, it's boring. It feels like you're treading over the same ground for much of it. And even when it tries to inject new lore into the series, it is not entertaining. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't substantively add to it. And it, it, it asks a lot more questions than it ever answers and not in a good way. Like all the kid stuff. I'm just like, why are we doing this again? Why, why do we have two kids? Who was Robbie? Who was the father of Robbie? Is he a demon child? Is he just a kid who's possessed or under the influence of his mother? I I don't know. None of those questions are answered. And it's a bummer. Um, But, but, you know, as we're wrapping things up here, I would still argue that the third one is pretty good. So, you know, we kind of end up in the same place we were in the last episode when we talked about these movies where it's like, well, one of them's pretty good. Um, I, you know, I don't think it's great. Again, we're not reaching the high heights of the original paranormal activity, which is kind of a classic or a modern classic. Um, it, it's still entertaining enough and has decent characters. And, you know, this has none of that. So (laughs) you, you have been duly warned. Um, I am going to try to get more of a show together for next week because now I have some time off. In fact, I am at a point where I'm literally just waiting for grades to come in to prove that I have in fact graduated before I can do anything else. And so, you know, all I got to do really is do some moving and cleaning and, um, you know, that kind of thing, but I've got some leisure time in front of me and I fully expect that I will, uh, do a little bit of podcast work during that time to keep myself occupied. So, you know, I don't get into too much trouble. Um, so yeah, but we're going to call it there for today. Uh, you know, and also we've got a what you watching coming up. We got another heart of horror coming up this month. Um, and I, I am, you know, just to spoil it, uh, I've been, what is it? Is it bloody bodybuilder in hell? Bloody muscle bodybuilder in hell is one of those. I like that is the next thing I want to do with, uh, Richard Schmidt. And I'm just trying to get my notes together on that so I can sit down and, uh, have a conversation about that. That makes some sense. Um, but that's going to do it for this one. And thank you, uh, as ever for, for sticking with me while I've been, you know, going to school and doing life stuff. And, uh, I, I don't have any good kid stories this week. Um, mostly because I've been doing nothing but exams and papers and, and that kind of thing. So, you know, um, I haven't been engaging, uh, with, with the kids in the same way, but that is all changing as I am now, you know, 24 seven around them. And I will report back from the front lines as needed. Uh, and that'll do it. So, um, as ever, you know, be sure you are, you are subscribing to the podcast feed. If you're listening to this and, uh, be sure you head over to the, um, discord channel, which I will, uh, be participating in more now that I actually have some time on my hands and can catch up on some horror, uh, viewings. And also this month is all about that too, because I'll be, uh, putting together that top 10 list. Um, I guess, you know, first week of January is when I'm going to try to record that. And I I need to check with Jamie and see if she wants to record that with me, maybe do our our dueling list for, uh, what you're watching, but I'll, I'll have that list on the side as well over at legionpodcast.com. Uh, where you can find this show, many others, as well as uh, find links to the Discord and all that stuff. So, um, all right, that's going to do it this time. Thank you, uh, as always, for listening. And thank you, as always, for joining the Dark Parade. We'll see you next week. 